We thank you for this, another opportunity to minister to these, your precious sheep. Thank you, Lord, that revelation and knowledge will flow freely, uninterrupted and unhindered by any satanic or demonic force. And Father, I pray that you will speak through my vocal cords and think through my mind. None of me and all of you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. I, uh, I want to start off by saying to you that I'm still growing and that the teachings that I've shared in times past on the subject of tithing were not correct. And today I stand in and humility to correct some things that I've taught for years and believed for years, but could never under, understand it clearly because I had not yet been confronted with the gospel of grace, which has made the difference. I won't apologize because if it wasn't for me going down that route, I would have never ended up where I am right now. But I will say that I have no shame at all at saying to you, throw away every book, every tape, and every video I ever did on the subject of tithing, unless it lines up with this. I've, I've done some corrective teaching in the, in, the, in the last 10 years, but not to the degree of what we're getting ready to do now. So why is this important? Because religion is sustained by two factors, fear and guilt. And if it's one subject that the church has used for a long time to keep people in fear and guilt, it is in that subject of tithing. And it has to be corrected, and it's got to be corrected now I may lose some friends. Preachers may not ever invite me no more, but I think I've already been through that, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> Go with me in our text today in the book of Romans chapter 6 and verse 14. Romans chapter 6 and verse 14. And we're going to begin this, oh, probably two or three or four weeks as we really dig into it. Now, you don't know it, the last two weeks I've been setting you up for this one. You knew it, right? And some of y'all already know what I'm getting ready to say. You knew it, because the gospel of grace has brought you to that place of understanding as well. But it's just that elephant in the room or the elephant in the body of Christ that needs to be dealt with. Romans chapter 6 and verse 14. Let's read it out loud together. Ready? Read. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law but you're under grace. That's not just a cute little verse of Scripture. That's literally, you are not living and you are not conducting your life under the Mosaic law, which tithing is a part of the, of the law. You are not living. You are not uh, conducting yourself under the law. Ever since Jesus rose again from the dead, you have been completely uh, set free from living under that dispensation. You are under grace. Say out loud, I live under grace. Now look at this in the NLT. You not only live under grace, you live according to grace. You live according to what Jesus has done. You live according to that new and living way. He says, sin is no longer your master, for you no longer live under the requirements of the law. Living under the requirements of the law made sin your master. Living under the requirements of the law made sin your master. He says sin is no longer your master. Why? Because you no longer live under the requirements of the law. So if you continue to try to live under the requirements and the dictates of the law, sin will continue to be your master. He says, instead, you live under the freedom of God's grace. And that's what we are. And that is the basis of this teaching right here that scripture that says we are no longer under the law, but we live under the freedom of God's grace. 
So let's just, let's just really jump right into this. Tithing is an Old Testament concept. I'm going to prove that to you. Tithing is an Old Testament concept. The tithe was a requirement of the law in which the Israelites were to give 10% of the crops they grew and the livestock they raised. They were supposed to give 10% of that to the temple or to the tabernacle. Now, there are several scriptures I just want to go over real quick. Leviticus 27 and 30, you can write these down. I'll read them to you. But Leviticus 27 verse 30 says, one-tenth of the produce of the land, whether grain from the fields or fruit from the trees, it belongs to the Lord and must be set apart to him as holy. Numbers chapter 18 and verse 26, and I read all these in the NLT. Numbers 18, 26 says, give these instructions to the Levites when you receive from the people of Israel the tithe I have assigned as your allotment Give a tenth of the tithe you receive, a tithe of the tithe to the Lord as a sacred offering. Then in Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 24 and 25, Deuteronomy 14, 24 and 25, now when the Lord your God blesses you with a good harvest, the place of worship he chooses for his name to be honored might be too far for you to bring the tithe. If so, you may sell the tithe portion of your crops and herds and put the money in a pouch and go to the place the Lord your God has chosen you. So he says if that temple is too far away from you, go ahead and sell the harvest, okay, and, and, and put the money in a pouch and then, you know, you can go take it there. And then 2 Chronicles chapter 31 and verse 5. 2 Chronicles chapter 31 and verse 5. He says in verse 5, he says, when the people of Israel heard these requirements, they responded generously by bringing the first share of their grain, the new wine, their olive oil, honey, and all the produce uh, of their fields. They brought a large uh, quantity, a tithe of all they produce. So in fact, the Old Testament law required multiple tithes. That's interesting, multiple tithes, one for the Levites, one for the use of the temple and the feast, one for the poor of the land, which would have pushed the total to around 23.3%. <laughs> Some understand the Old Testament tithe as a method of taxation to provide for the needs of the priests and the Levites in sacrificial systems. In some places, it's very clear in the Old Testament that they gave 14, around 12 to 14 different tithes over seven-year periods. But then after the death of Jesus Christ, Matthew 5, 17, this is important. After the death of Jesus Christ, I want to reiterate again, tithing is an Old Testament concept. But after the death of Jesus Christ, Jesus fulfilled the law. Look at that in Matthew 5, 17. Jesus said, think not that I am come to destroy the law. So Jesus didn't come to destroy the law and anything that was under the law, which included tithing, he said, or the prophets. He says, I'm not come to destroy it. I came to fulfill it. So in Mark, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you're going to see Jesus fulfilling all of the law and at the same time, talking about this new way that is to come. So after the death of Jesus Christ fulfilled the law, the New Testament, nowhere after the death of Jesus, there's nowhere, no, nowhere commands or, or any commandments or even recommends that Christians submit to a legalistic tithe system. The New Testament nowhere designates a percentage of income a person should set aside, but only says gifts should be in keeping with the income. Talks about giving of gifts. Look at 1 Corinthians 16 and 2 in the NLT. 1 Corinthians 16 and 2. Now, I know all, you know, first thing somebody's going to say is, well, Abraham tithe, you have to get the teaching we just did. Abraham met Melchizedek, who was unannounced, and Melchizedek came and blessed him 
and Melchizedek won the battle for him. And then when, when Abraham found all that out, he gave a tithe. He didn't give the tithe to get blessed. He was blessed before he gave the tithe. He didn't give the tithe to get the victory of the battle. He had already got the victory of the battle. And, and the Bible says Melchizedek showed up with bread and wine, which points to the body of Christ and the blood of Christ. That was a shadow of the grace of God showing up. And so he gave the tithe as an expression of his dependence upon God because Melchizedek said, here is the possessor of heaven and earth. And Abraham said, what do I need with anybody else or anything on this planet if I'll hook up with him? And when he gave his tithe, it was an expression of his dependence on God. The Lord woke me up at 530 this morning and he said this to me. And he said, get up and write it down before you lose it. He said that your giving is a response to my ability to take care of you. He said, when you give, it is your declaration of dependence on me. Can I, can I read that again? Yes. Your giving is a response to God's ability to take, take care of you. I give because I now know that God can take care of me. That's why Abraham gave. He gave a tenth of everything because he says, oh, that's the possessor of heaven and earth. I don't have to worry about nothing. So I'm going to give and I'm going to, in my giving, make a declaration that he is able to take care of me. You remember when Abraham said to the king of Sodom, I've lifted my hands up before God. I won't take nothing down to a thread or a shoe latchet. So you won't ever be able to say you made Abram rich, but I have declared my dependence upon God. His tithe, his giving was a response to God's ability to take care of him. Chick-fil-A don't open on Sunday because it is a response that God is able to take care of them. Look at 1 Corinthians 16 and 2. Watch this. On the first day of each week, you should so this is the only place where he's talking about putting something aside. Watch this. The first day of each week, you should uh, each put aside a portion of the money you have earned. Don't wait until I get there, Paul said, and then try to collect it all at once. So notice what he said. He says, put aside a portion of your money. He didn't say what percentage. He just said, put aside a portion of your money. So some in the Christian church have taken 10%, a 10% figure from the Old Testament tithe and applied it as the recommended minimum for Christians in their giving. He didn't say that. He didn't say that. He says, I want you to take a portion and put it aside. Now, if you want to give 10%, that's fine. But, you know, he didn't say that. I, 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 want to, I want to get to a particular place where you understand that he is not requiring New Testament believers to operate in the Old Testament system of tithing which included a blessing and a curse. If you're under grace, Jesus took the curse away and you are already blessed. <laughs> All right, now watch this. The New Testament talks about the importance and the benefits of giving. That's what it talks about. We are to give as we are able. And sometimes that means giving more than 10%. Sometimes that means giving less. It all depends on the ability of the Christian and the needs of the body of Christ. So every Christian should diligently pray and seek God's wisdom in the matters of participating uh, on how much you should give. That's the whole point. We're Christians now under the grace of God. We have a relationship with God. We need to be talking to God about giving us wisdom in our giving. Somebody says that ain't Bible. Look at James chapter 1 and 5. James chapter 1 and 5. There's no fun in you just bucket plunking. He wants you to spend some time with him. Lord, what you want me to do? James 1 and 5. If any, if any of you lack wisdom, wisdom is knowing what to do when you don't know what to do. How many of you have been in a situation when you, have, you don't know what to do? He says, if any of you lack wisdom, 
Let him ask of God that give it to all men, how? Liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given to him. So wisdom is available. Now, above all giving, above all giving should be given with pure motives. It should be given with an attitude of worship to God, and it should be given as a service to the body of Christ. So according to 2 Corinthians 9, 7, 2 Corinthians 9 and 7, Look what he says here. He says, you must each decide in your, in your own heart how much to give. New Testament, you must decide in your own heart how much to give. And don't give reluctantly or don't give in response to pressure. Well, the, the tithing teaching always pressured me. It gave me fear. Malachi 3 and 10 says, what's that? You are cursed with a curse. I remember one time I, my tithe was like, uh, I don't know what it was, a uh, hundred and some dollars and 26 cents, and I didn't have the 26 cents. And somebody put a brick through my window, the, uh, my car window of a new car I had, and uh, Taff and I just got married, and, and, and as soon as I did that, the condemnation of tithing and not tithing came up, and, I, and, and, and I'm like, you know, the devil just spoke to me and said, see there, if you tithe, then this wouldn't happen. The only reason that happened is God. it was fear-based. He says, you're never to give in response to pressure. See, the reason why you ain't getting that job is because you ain't tithing. You should never give. That's pressure. You should never give in response to pressure. I tell you what, and now one of y'all going to get blessed until you start tithing. You should never give responding to pressure. He just told you how to give. You decide, going to God, seeking wisdom, decide in your heart what you should give, for God loves a person who gives cheerfully. And certainly, when God puts something in your heart and wisdom comes in your heart, what the actions are going to be cheerful in their, in their giving. And that's, that's the recommendation we get here. Now, I'm not suggesting that we water down our giving. But let's admit, tithing is an Old Testament teaching. The New Testament contains a theme that overrides it. So set aside your emotions, please, just for a moment, and let's see what the New Testament actually says about tithing. Since we're no longer under the law, let's see what the New Testament actually says. I know what you've been told it said. I know what I might have told you 30 years it said, 30 years ago what it said. Let's see what it actually says. All right, let's look at uh, Matthew 23 and Luke 11, 42. They, they say basically the same thing. Jesus' words about tithing are brief. There are only really two comments here uh, uh, from Jesus, but watch this. Uh, he said, uh, and this is so interesting here. He said, woe unto you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe. You pay tithe of mint and, and, and anus and common and have committed the weightier, you have omitted, you have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. Now watch this. These ought you to have done and not to leave the other, the other undone. All right, so he's going in here, and Jesus is criticizing the Pharisees for neglecting the law about justice and mercy and faithfulness in their tithing. And again, for you tithe in these things, but you're neglecting the others. What is he talking about, the others? The other laws. You're, 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 you're keeping this law, but you're neglecting the other laws. So to be sure they are tithing, they absolutely were tithing. And Jesus says, you should, you should keep that law of tithing this, this, and this. But you shouldn't neglect the other laws about this, this, and this. All right, now watch this. So they are tithing, but they're tithing with wrong attitudes. No justice, no mercy, no faithfulness. 
Others is plural in the New American Standard Bible, and it refers to the Old Testament laws, not only to tithing law, but all of the laws in the Old Testament. You know what Jesus was saying? He says, I want you to be a good Jew. Don't neglect Jewish laws, because can't be a good Jew if you're, if you're a Jewish person if you're neglecting Jewish laws. He says in verse 24, they're so busy, you know, you know, straining through water so they won't swallow a gnat while at the same time they're swallowing a camel. What is he saying? They got wrong priorities. So he's not teaching on tithing here in verse 23. He's teaching on being a good Jewish person living under the law. And to be a good Jewish person living under the law, you can't do this part of the law and neglect the other parts of the law. Does everybody clearly see that? Many will say, well, see, Jesus is teaching on the law. Here's, what, here's, what, here's how I was taught. Jesus said, you tithe in this, 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 and you ought to. And they stopped right there. See there? You ought to. I ought to what? See, you ought to tithe. He, it's out of context. The context is Jewish people living under the law Tithing according to the law, don't neglect, don't neglect the rest of the law. He's not talking to New Testament Christ Christians. Jesus is, Jesus is operating as a prophet, fulfilling the law, and he is speaking to them as an Old Testament prophet, fulfilling the law, and he is saying to them, you should be tithing according to the law, but you shouldn't be neglecting the rest of the laws. Luke 11, 42 says basically the, the same thing here now. Now, to be sure that they are tithing, uh, well, let, let, let's, let's, look, let's, let's, look at, let's look at something. Most people will tell you Jesus is advocating tithing for the new way that, he, that he's announcing in the gospel. He is not. He is just teaching as an Old Testament prophet according to the Jewish law. Now, there's another place we see him talking about tithing. Luke 18 and verse 12. All right, now check this out. This is so serious here. Jesus mentioned tithing in Luke chapter 18 and 12, where a Pharisee was boasting. You remember the story about the Pharisee and the publican? Where the Pharisee was boasting, he said, I fast twice a week and I give tenth of all I get. And again, Jesus does not speak against tithing, but challenges the Pharisee where his self-righteousness is concerned. Let, let me back up here. Look at, look, at, uh, look at this in the NLT, and let's back up to verse 11, Luke 18, 11, and read through this. There's a lot going on here. Luke 18, 11, and the Pharisee stood by himself, and he prayed this prayer. I thank you, God, that I am not like other people. All right, you're going to see the Pharisee is self-righteous. I'm not a cheater, a sinner, an adulterer, and I'm certainly not like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give you a tenth of my income. You, met, you ever met people in church today that, that they tell you, I'm a tiger? <laughs> and what does that mean? That means you're still under the law, huh? <laughs> I give you a tenth of my income, Lord. Come on. But the tax collector stood at the distance and dared not even lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed. Instead, he beat his chest in sorrow, saying, Oh God, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. And verse 14 tells you, I tell you, this sinner, not the Pharisee, return home justified before God. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Do you see Jesus teaching on time in here? He was rebuking this guy for his self-righteousness. Self-righteous people are people who strive to get right with God. And religion and self-righteousness are the same thing. Religion is the same as self-righteousness. It's, it's man's pursuit to make himself right before God. Religion and self-righteousness operates through guilt and fear. Guilt and fear. So when you're religious, there's some guilt and some fear. Dependency on guilt is what keeps religion alive and well. 
And like a drug dealer giving an addict a small dose of, of the drug to keep him coming back, so, what, so what's happening in the church is we used to give you a small dose of fear and guilt. You ought to be ashamed of yourself for not tithing. That's why none of you, and the thing that bothered me about it is that I never met too many churches that had even 10% of the people in their church tithing. It was like the rest of your church knew something was wrong with this and you kept pushing it and you were pushing hard for only about seven or six people, six, six people, six or seven percent of the people tithing anyway because they figured, I don't understand. I don't know. I don't know about that. I don't know about that. And it turns out they was right. Whew. Is that the same Creflo dollar? What happened? I'm growing, honey. I'm growing. I'm growing. I'm growing. Glory to God. Jesus does not teach tithing. He challenges the Jew to tithe with the proper attitude. So what about the Apostle Paul? Let's look at the Apostle Paul right quick. As a former Pharisee, Paul, former Pharisee, a, a former person who lived under the law, we would expect him to advocate tithing. He lived under the law. He was a Pharisee. But when Paul taught giving, he never mentioned the T word. Never. Now, if you think it was such a requirement under grace, why did the guy who got the revelation of grace, why did he never mention the T word? Now, you'll even hear grace people say to you, watch out for those preachers who talk about, you know, you, you, you shouldn't be tithing in church, something wrong. No, 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 you, you, better, you better go back a little bit. Either you're living under grace or you're living under the law or you're living under a mixture. And nothing happens when you live under a mixture of law and grace. Let's see what Paul had to say. Let's look at this in the NLT, all of them. 1 Corinthians 16, 1 through 4. Look at what Paul had to say. Now, regarding your question about the money being collected for God's people in Jerusalem, you should follow the same procedure I gave to the church in, in Galatia. Verse 2, on the first day of each week, you should each put aside a portion of money you have earned. Don't wait until I get there and then try to collect it all at once. Uh, when I come, I'll write letters of recommendation for the messengers you choose to deliver your gift to Jerusalem. Uh, and it and if it seems appropriate for me to go along, uh, they can travel with me. So he, he didn't mention the T word there. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 6, 17 through 19. 1 Timothy 6, 17 and 19. Well, this is kind of boring. When are you going to shout? No, no, no. We need to get taught. We, we, when you done had something wrong go on the inside of you, you got to teach that thing out. So you can shout after I say amen. 1 Timothy 6, 17 and 19, he said, teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud and not to trust in their money, which is so unreliable. Their trust should be in God, who richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment. Tell them to use their money to do good. They should be rich in good works and generous to those in need, always being ready to share with others. By doing this, they will be storing up their treasure as a good foundation for the future so that they may experience true life. He didn't say anything about T-word. Look at 2 Corinthians. Well, you, homework, homework. Go home and read 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and chapter 9. Both of them talk about Paul's instructions on giving, and he never mentioned the T-word there. He did not mention the T-word, but uh, if... if Let's see, let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. And, uh, well, no, you go read it. Read it yourself. <laughs> Give you a little something to do. Galatians 6 and 6, and then I'll go on. Never mention the T word. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 6. Those who are taught the word of God should provide for their teachers, sharing all good things with them. He didn't mention the T word. Why not? Why didn't Paul mention the T word? Obviously, Paul did not want new Gentile believers to be tempted by Judaism. He didn't want new Gentile believers to be tempted by 
Judaism, which operated under the law. Here is a new and a living way. And so what happens, keeping the gospel pure without adding Jewish rules was his constant concern. Under the law, rule-keeping was the administrator of morality. In other words, if you keep all of these rules, it should produce a better type of person. It failed miserably. So now rule-keeping has been replaced by the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost now is the administrator of morality. And he starts working you and changing you from the inside out. He takes away your old want-tos and give you new want-tos, and you're waking up one day trying to figure out what happened to that thing I used to want to do. The Holy Ghost has been working in you. And he does not want to mix, he does not want to mix and add Jewish rules to this new and living way, to this gospel of grace. I got to thinking about this. This just this blew my mind. There was a question that was asked in Acts chapter 15. Let's go verse 5 and then verse 28 uh, in the New Living Translation. There was a famous Jerusalem council, remember that, in Acts chapter 15, that decided if the Gentiles had to adhere to Jewish law. And the answer was a sum total of no, which means they didn't have to uh, submit to Jewish, Jewish law where tithing is concerned. Look at this. I'm going to read two verses, Acts 15, 5, and then verse 28. But then some of the believers who belonged to the sect of Pharisees, they stood up and insisted the Gentiles' converts must be circumcised and required to follow the law of Moses. And so they took this amongst the council to see, all right, should Gentiles have to live under the law that was specifically given to Jewish people? And they talked it over and looked at it and so forth. And verse 28 says, for it seems good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay no greater burden on you than these few requirements. Go to the next verse. <laughs> You must abstain from eating food offered to idols, from consuming blood of the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. And if you do this, we good. Farewell. And I break down what the answer was. No, you don't have to keep Jewish law, which includes the law of tithing. Just do these three things and we good. The Jerusalem Council decided that. And now the church in, in the world decided against what the Jerusalem Council decided. The law was a part of tithing. When, when something is a part of the law, it is a part of the law and it's demonstrated because there will be a blessing and there will be a curse. Go to Malachi chapter 3. Yeah, Malachi. Oh, Malachi. Oh, Malachi. Go back, go, back, go to verse 8. Do, do it in the King James. I want to do it in the language that we've heard all our lives. <laughs> okay, King James. All right. Will a man rob God? I mean, you've heard of Malachi's son. If you've been in church at any time, will a man rob God? Watch this. I don't want to rob God. You want to rob God? I ain't robbing God. That's already set me up. Will a man rob God? What the world? Yet, he says, you have robbed me. <gasps> you robbed God. But you say, wherein have we robbed thee? He said, in tithes and offerings. Mm, mm, mm. Ought to be a shame of yourself. That's where the shame comes from now. You done robbed God. You're a bunch of crooks. If you don't give your tithe, you're a crook robbing God. Well, Pastor, I want to set up a, a counseling session. Do you tithe? Right. 
Well, I have a gift. I want to sing in the choir. Do you tithe? Do you, do you tithe? Because if you can't sing in this choir, if you are tithing. Because we're not going to have a bunch of robbers sitting up there robbing God with some robbing anointing coming through the airways. It's fear and guilt. It keeps religion alive. Now watch this. You are cursed. Kick off with a curse. For you have robbed me. You have robbed even a whole nation. Next verse. Bring ye all the tithes in the storehouse. Now, I'm going to show you a little bit later on. We equated the church with the storehouse. The church, and the, the church and the storehouse don't equal. The storehouse was something that was built because the temples didn't have enough room to store all the tithes, so they built granaries. The church is not, is not a storehouse for granary. Bring you all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be meat in my house and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts. If I'll not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive. You see, under grace, the window has opened. Jesus has come out the window. The blessing has been dispensed. Lord, forgive me. But in those days, you know, in the preaching circle, now you can't say nothing. That's too often what everybody else is saying. You got to stay right there in the boundary of everybody else saying that. Now you can't say that now. And I figure since I have been excommunicated three, four times, <laughs> I'm good. I, I'm, already, I'm already out of the boundaries. I'm already... All right, it's just me and Taffy. Taffy's still my friend. I'm good. Because, see, Taffy can do some stuff for me that can't none of the preacher can do for me. You understand what I'm saying there. I, I, really, I really thank God for that. You understand? Bring, bring it to the storehouse, girl. You know what I'm saying? Watch yourself. Sh okay, all right. How do you even use this if you're no longer under the law, but under grace? And Galatians says that Jesus has taken, he became a curse for us, that the blessing of Abraham, of knowing that he's the possessor of heaven and earth, he gave us his son, that he'll give us everything else. He took the curse from us. Don't you let nobody tell you you cursed. You are not cursed. You are blessed. You got Jesus in your life. You are blessed. You are blessed. Come ye blessed of my Father. You are blessed. Don't let nobody tell you you curse. And some denominations say, well, you know, all black people are cursed because of the mark that he put on who was that? Ham. And so it spread it, and that's how you made black people. You better shut your mouth up. I ain't no way in a war I'm cursed. Hallelujah. I'm, I'm too blessed. Glory to God. I can't, I can't, even, I can't even spell curse. Let's see. K U N I D A B A S H A T A. I'm blessed. I'm blessed going in. I'm blessed coming out. I'm blessed when I go to bed. I'm blessed when I wake up in the morning. I'm blessed. Not because of something that I have done, but because the possessor and heaven and earth had decided to release his grace upon me. And even if I didn't deserve it, and, and because I didn't earn it, he decided to bless me anyway because I believe. Hallelujah. And now all of a sudden I will be cursed because I don't get 10%? I'm going to give because, you know, if you give, it'll be given unto you. But you're telling me I got to give 10%? Even Jewish people gave more than 10%. They gave almost 20-some percent or more. 
and I'm cursed because I didn't give 10 percent. That don't match nothing. But the law, but we're not under the law. We're under grace. So how much is enough? <laughs> I found an uh, excellent illustration. I think it would help you. It, it's, it's a little... I'll give it to you and you decide what you want to do with it. Okay, you ready? If 10% is the standard, then consider what happens to, give me a name, uh, uh, Johnny Blue. If 10% is the standard, then consider what happens to Johnny Blue, a new believer. You just met him at Bible study on Wednesday night for the first time. Johnny Blue earns $806 per month take home. It's about uh, $9,672 for a year, probably below the poverty line in America. Uh, to tithe, he would have to give $80 each month, leaving him $726 to live on. And rent for his modest apartment was $500 per month. His teenage son lived with him. Uh-oh. <laughs> and he took care of another son on the weekend. What we call him? Johnny Blue? Johnny Blue heard his pastor teaching on tithing, and on the next Wednesday, he asked Sister Ann, should he give 10%? And she said very skeptically, I couldn't, he, he said, I, could, I couldn't make it if I did that. Now, would you have, would you advise Johnny Blue to tithe? Yeah, based on what we all been taught, you would. Because you were taught that that was the magic pill. Yeah. <laughs> and real magic pill was just, I'm dependent on God and I'm going to give what God tell me to give. Because if he had a problem with the 10th, what was that, what was that widow woman going to do? She didn't have no 10%. She just had a, a widow's might. And Jesus said she gave more than everybody in the place. Okay. And so you got another dude who lived across town. He earned $250,000 a year. Like Adam, he was, he was a growing believer who wanted to honor Christ. If he gave 10%, that would leave him with $225,000 for living expenses. Now, is my $250,000 friend off the hook if he tithes? Most of us would say, yeah. He, he should do more because, I mean, check him out. He made $250,000. Look at what he's giving. <laughs> well, that's what makes it so perfect. Yeah. No. Nah. And here's, a, here's another thing I thought about. 10% belongs to God, and the rest is yours. God better not even think about asking me for no more. <laughs> I done gave you your horse, now leave mine alone. <laughs> Many Christians are content to tithe, thinking that they're obeying the Bible. 10% for the Lord and 90% for me. So how much is enough? If the New Testament is silent on tithing, does it offer some other guidelines? I, I think so. Look at Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21, uh, verses 1 through 4. Let's, li let's look at it in the NASB. Luke 21 verses 1 through 4. The familiar story of Jesus observing the rich men and a poor widow woman putting their gifts in treasure. And so Jesus said to the woman, he said, uh, said, said, said uh, Jesus said the widow woman put in more than all, even though she gave only two small copper coins. Now, why would he say he gave, she gave more than them all? 
Scripture says, because she gave out of her poverty, she gave out of her living, whereas the rich gave out of their surplus. Jesus commended the widow woman because her giving affected her lifestyle. If we give only out of surplus, we've missed the point. You should be giving out of your living. You shouldn't be giving out of your savings. You ought to be giving out of that pot that you buy your groceries with and it, 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 out of your living. This is going to impact my living. I was preparing my offering this morning, and I had an amount, and I, and I thought to myself, this ain't doing, this ain't doing, I, it, it's not moving me. And I thought, if, my, if what I give it doesn't move me, it probably ain't going to move God either. Watch this. So Jesus commended this widow woman because she gave out of her lifestyle. He said she gave out of her living. They gave out of their surplus. It didn't move them. It don't move a millionaire to come in church every Sunday and give $100. You can tell he didn't pray. He ain't asked God for no wisdom. God's requiring is you go and say, Lord, what do you want me to give? And, and, and don't let poverty infect your hearing. I don't know what God said, but I ain't got but $5, so that one I'm going to give here today. <laughs> no, you, you, you got $1,000 you was planning on going shopping with. Give, give $500 out of your living. I, I don't, it, it, it happens, it's been happening to me for 40 years. Every time I give the way God wants me to give, it ain't a week that go by that he don't bring it right back to me in my face. But you ain't going to know that because it's a relationship thing. God, what do you want me to do? And what moves you? He been too good to me. He's the possessor of heaven and earth. I ain't never going to have to worry about nothing because he's able to take care of me. So I'm going to express, I'm going to express my confidence in his ability to take care of me. Yeah, I'm going to get this. How you going to ever know if he's going to be able to take care of you? And what you going to do when everything else fails, when you're playing religious games? Do you know him for yourself, and do you believe he can take care of you? All right, get used to it now. Let him start taking care of you now. I done took the T-word out of things. Some of y'all still scared. No, I depend on God. He will take care of me. We start building this building. Over $20 million, we start building this building and had no idea where the money's come from. I went to the bank, I said, we need to get a loan. They laughed, you ain't getting no loan. She, she, in fact, she said, you ain't getting a loan. Ain't nobody gonna give you the money. And God had already told me, don't go to the bank and borrow none. I went anyway. <laughs> I couldn't see how. <laughs> and she got up in my face. You know, back in the day, I think it was CNS Bank. That might tell you, ain't nobody gonna give you that money. I was like, oh, Collie Park gonna go. I bet, don't, 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 don't spit in my face now. You need to back up now. I'm, I'm saved, but I ain't that saved. <laughs> you know, I just got saved yesterday. <laughs> and, and, man, she hurt my feelings. And God said, I told you. I'm going to do this. I said, all right, God. All right, fine. I just got a question. Being facetious with God. We ain't got no money. How are we going how we, how, how we to get started? What are we going to do? How are we going to start? He said, get started. I said, we ain't got no money. <laughs> now watch God. He said, how much does it cost to dig a hole? Uh, Yes, yes, sir. So we dug a hole. We got started. We dug a hole. Didn't cost a dime. That hole was dug debt free. <laughs> ah! Sometimes God just wants you to get started. Sometimes He just wants you to crank the car up. Sometimes He just wants you to put it in drive. Hallelujah. I believe we got a picture of that. Brother Chris, you had your foot on a, on a shovel. And he didn't charge us for his foot. Yeah. 
Then it started rolling in. And it kept coming. And we kept growing and learning stuff. And we moved in here. Not to a building that was just prayed for, but it was paid for. And all the way today, even with other churches and properties around the world, the ministry is totally debt-free. We owe nobody nothing. We didn't need to get no PPPH at loan or whatever them things were. We didn't need to get none of that because we had already lifted our hands up before God that He would take care of us, the possessor of heaven and earth. And that's what God wants out of all of us. Let me take care of you. Pray about what you want me to do. And I tell you, and he, we did like this widow woman right here. There were times we gave it all away. We didn't, we, if God didn't move, we were going to have to move. <laughs> but the wisdom of God told me. I didn't do it. Well, you know how we do. Well, if you did it for them, you would do it for me. Not necessarily. They had a revelation. God told them to do it. You heard the testimony about them doing it, and now you tried to do something that you heard testify, but you ain't got no revelation from God himself. Breakthrough doesn't come just from reading the Bible. Breakthrough comes from a word, when you get a word from God, not just a word of God, but a word from God. And when God and wisdom shows you how to do something, ain't no devil in hell going to be able to stop. Second Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 7, what did the Apostle Paul say? Paul exhorted Christ's followers to abound or increase in generosity. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 7, he says, he said, but just as you abound in everything, he said, you, you abound in faith, you abound in utterance, you abound in knowledge and in all earnestness and in the love we inspired with you. See that you abound in this gracious work of giving also. Increase in that giving also. <laughs> a, a, a quote by C.S. C. S. Lewis, he said this. He said, I'm afraid biblical charity is more than merely giving away that which we could afford to do without anyway. anyway. In other words, giving away your junk. People used to do that with church. Let's take the junk up to the church. We don't take no junk. When we give, when we stock our clothing area, those, some of those clothes still got tags on them. We look at your raggedy junk, it's reject. We can't take this. You want to bring your raggedy furniture? We can't take that. Well, y'all the church, y'all are supposed to want everything. No, we represent the kingdom. We operate in a spirit of excellence. We're not just going to take your junk. You, you go throw your junk away. Don't give it to us to throw it away because we certainly going to throw it away. Now, right along here now, some of y'all feeling, well, I don't want to hear this prosperity gospel. You better get your thinking right. This is more than prosperity gospel. This is a declaration of dependence upon God to take care of you. Because I promise you, there's coming a time real soon where you're going to need somebody like God to take care of you because ain't nobody else going to be around to take care of you. And I'm just trying to show you how to get taken care of, and I'm trying to show you how to get your bag when you need it by trusting God and not trusting systems and men that's going to let you down. How is it that God healed you, God delivered you, God saved you, but then he ain't got nothing to do with you where physical, natural things are concerned? He wants to meet those needs as well. Something must be crackerjack in your head that you think God just want to sit back and let you be homeless and suffer. And No! He's not that kind of God. Where you just preaching it for your own benefit. Listen, I'm not going to apologize for being blessed, but believe me, I'm blessed. I keep trying to give it away, and it keep coming back. I keep trying to get rid of it, and it keep coming back. I don't know what else to do. I done tried to act poor, but it just won't do right. I 
remember when I was, I was given, <laughs> I, I gave some jury away. And, and it, it wouldn't stop coming back. I had jury coming from all over the country. I'm like, my God, what are we going to do? They bought big boxes of jury. And I just shared it with my staff, but now I'm giving it away again. And they kept coming again. And I'm like, how do we stop this? <laughs> there were people getting married. I said, you bought the ring yet? <laughs> Got something for you. <laughs> I want to give because I'm motivated by a God who, who won't stop giving to me. He, he gives me healing. He gives me peace. He gives me love. He wakes me up in the morning. He gives me the money to pay my bills. He, he, he just won't stop. He won't leave me alone. He keep running me over with his blessings. He keep me. I ain't trying to. I gave 150 cars away. And the church gave me an appreciation service. I don't know how many years ago. How many years that was? 20-something, 30 years ago? 151, 100. Oh, oh, I don't even know how many cars we gave. We, we bought so many cars for people. And he told me to come to the stage, and there was a Rolls Royce came out there, and I fell out. And then I thought, oh, Lord. <laughs> These colored people going to think I stole money. <laughs> These colored people are going to think I stole money and bought a Rolls Royce. And half the colors are in the room. Y'all see, y'all giving it to me. I kid you not. A week later, my sons came together. We had the gathering of our sons come together. And they said, Dad, we got a surprise. What is it? Walked outside, it was another Rolls Royce. I, said, I, I told Tepper, I said, I'm scared. <laughs> I don't even know what to do. I don't even know what to do. I could not even receive from God because I was so in bondage to people. I was so scared with the people there. And so, and so I gave the first row, I gave it away. Because I, I, was on, on, I was doing interviews, I think I was on 2020, and they said, so you have a Rolls Royce? And I said, yes, but I'm giving it and selling it and giving the money to the children's ministry. And I thought that was satisfied. And guess who talked to me immediately after the interview? God. He said, I gave that to you because I wanted to bless you. And you let people bondage cause you to give away what I blessed you with? I felt so bad. I called my son. I said, listen, go find that Rolls Royce. He said, how? I said, go find it. I don't care what you got to do. Just go around the nation and every state you got to, but you find that Rolls Royce. That was God's love that he was trying to show on me, and I let people bondage talk me out, and that was the year I got free from people, free from colored folks, free from church folks. I got free from white folks. I got free from everybody, praise God. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! My God wants to bless you. I'm sorry you don't want to receive it. I apologize that you hate the prosperity gospel, but that's still not going to stop his, his, his abounding, his abounding provision. He's going to keep increasing his provision on you. He's going to keep blessing you. He's going to keep turning things around for you. He's going to keep increasing you. He's going to keep healing you because he's Jehovah Jireh. He can't help it. He's going to do it anyway. I dare you to give him a shout. Give him a shout in here, somebody. <laughs> Hallelujah! Hallelujah! God is not going to let some sinner outlive you and you depend on him. But he couldn't do it because you were under law or you were missing law with grace, and it was holding back what he wanted to do. The motive can't ever be most stuff. The motive can't be, well, I'm going to do this so God can bless me. It ain't going to happen. The motive has got to be, I depend on you. I lift my hands to you like Abraham. And I will give any way you tell me to give. 
because I have no fear that you are the God that knows how to take care of me. You gave me your son, and you told me i will give you everything else you want, but I trust God. I depend on him. I don't depend on no money. There's a lot of things money can't do for you. I depend on him. What you going to do when money can't buy a cure because they ain't got one? What you going to do when money buy a house but can't turn it into a home? What you going to do when money can buy you a woman can't, but can't buy you somebody that'll love you all your life? No, 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 no. You know what the love of money is? Is when you trust money more than you trust God. The love of money is the root. You know what he's saying? Your dependency and trust on money is the root to all of the evil that you'll see in your life. And some people trust money more than they trust God until they turn that money into their God, and now they've committed idolatry because they value money more than they value God. What you'll do for money, you just can't seem to do for God. You'll be on time for the job to get the money, but you can't be on time for church. You will spend time studying to get more money, but you won't spend time praying and letting God speak to you and give you wisdom. It ain't never been give a tithe and watch God go to work. It, that's no better than come on, Jeannie. This is always about love, for God so loved the world. Look at the reflex that he gave. And then you walk around telling how much you love God and can't figure out how to even go before God and say, Lord, I know you love me. What do you want me to do? And it could be in all kinds of different ways, all kinds of service. It's not always going to be in money. It's going to be in all kinds of service that you do for the Lord. And just because my last name was Dollar, I've, I've almost been dismissed from the credibility of ministry. You're here with Pastor Dollar. Oh, that crook? You don't, you don't, you don't, even, you don't even know, man. I, I'm saved for real because if I won, I'd be gonna bust you up on your face. If I won, I, I, I'd be gonna bury you where I know where the bodies is. What you talking about? I'd just be a kingpin boss. But what you talking about? I would hurt you but I'm saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost, fire baptized. But in the midst of all of that, they still hadn't been able to, 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 to put me down because God just keep loving me. Now, you got to be ready. Because people don't understand the blessing on you. The blessing on you looks like you committed a crime. And God getting ready to bless you, world changers, to the point where it looked like you did something wrong to get out of the bus. God is getting ready to bless you like it looked like, looked like you did something wrong to get it. And when they come and accuse you of doing something wrong, tell them like Abraham, I've already lifted my hands up before God that no man made me rich but God only. my heart, I go before God, what would you have me to give? I want to worship you, Lord. I depend on you, Lord. I trust you. I need you. And giving now becomes just as much a part of my worship as my song singing, as my dancing, as my lifting my hands. I get to give, and I got to. I get to give. Now, for some reason, if you're cool with starting off at 10%, that's the thing. It ain't no, it ain't no crime. 
but you can't make it mandatorily the law for New Testament Christians to give 10%. That's all I'm saying. New Testament is clear about giving, but not by a law that says either you tithe or you're going to be cursed. You know that ain't God no more. That was, and that's what Jesus lived under. That's what he fulfilled. And you know I'm going to get letters. I ain't reading none of them. I don't read letters no more. <laughs> if it costs me my peace, it's too expensive. I ain't, spending my peace. I ain't spending my peace on nobody's drama or nobody's emergency. People call me, tell me I got an emergency. I don't do emergencies. <laughs> because if I'm going to live long and stay on this earth, I got to learn how to be a man of ease and a man of peace. I can't, I can't take all that. Drama and stuff like I used to, I ain't doing that. You know, I ain't still 30. <laughs> I may look like it sometimes. <laughs> sometimes I look 79. <laughs> I just want you to be free and, and finally, Choose Jesus. He loves you. He cares for you. You know how much it takes for me to get up here and correct my teaching? Yeah. Not all pastors to do that. Not all preachers to do that. They're not going to do that. They're going to make you think it was all right. We'll just be quiet. Shh, don't nobody say nothing. But I'm pretty correct in my teaching and others' teachings. It's, it's, it'll go around the world before them tomorrow night. That's why we love you. Yeah, I love y'all too, man. I don't want to be nowhere else. But if, listen, if God, if God told me I had to go to another church to preach, I, I might quit for a minute, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Bow your heads. My time's all on. We'll pick up with this. If y'all come back next week, we'll pick up with this. Lord, we, we get it. Melchizedek showed up before Abraham, unexpected. Nobody knew he was coming. But by your grace, you sent a priest with the bread and the wine in his hands. He showed up right after the victory that was given that no way he in the world Abram could have won. Then he sat down and he blessed Abraham with an understanding of who God was, the possessor of heaven and earth. And Abram responded that I am going to give to my God as a response to his ability to take care of me. Help us to get that revelation that our giving is responding to you being the possessor of heaven and earth, you being the provider, you being the one that can take care of us in any arena of our lives. Now, Holy Spirit, I trust you to teach this into our souls and into our spirits. Let our tradition not rob us from the Word. Open the ears of the people of God that they may hear your wisdom and we may worship you in the beauty of your holiness. Help me, Lord, to continue to grow and help me to articulate stuff and say stuff like you want me to say it. And give us all sweet lips so we can see learning increase. May the blessings of God begin to run the world change over until he just can't help but give it away because he ain't got no more room to receive. Not just stuff, but character and love 
and those things that you lead us to do to treat people right. We give you praise for it now. Now, if you're in this place and you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life or if you're on the stream, I want you to say this simple prayer after me. Heavenly Father, I realize that I'm a sinner. But right now, I repent of all of my sins. I receive the free gift of forgiveness. I make you my Lord and my Savior. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. I receive you now in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Come on, give the Lord a big hand clap of praise. He is worthy of it. He's worthy of it. If you just prayed the prayer of salvation with me, text the key word, I'm saved, as one word to 51555. Provide your name and email address, and we'll send your free ebook as a gift to you today. If you prayed that prayer with me in the dome, just hold on just for a moment. We're going to have an altar call, and you can come down, and we'll get you some information that you need. Now, let's go ahead and participate in our final act of worship, and that is our giving. The final act of worship, that is our giving. You know, here's another thing I thought about too, Ken. You can't use Abraham and one time you found him giving and assume that he gave like that every time. Just too many assumptions. Well, you know, the tree in the garden, that was a type of tithe. That ain't what that was. The tree in the garden was either going to be a declaration of dependence on God or a declaration of independence from God. And it happened to be a declaration of independence from God because they heard, you just like God. And they said, well, shoot, we don't need God then. And they, they, they responded by eating the fruit of the tree, declaring their independence from God. No type of the time. We love taking the cheaper instead of the deeper. And we've got to stop assuming stuff into existence. Well, I'll tell y'all what, we need to pray for Brother Dollar. He's really, he's, he's off his rocker. Thank God I'm off that rocker. Thing wasn't comfortable anyway. <laughs> my business is right here. It ain't where everybody is. My business is right here. Amen. Let's go ahead and uh, ushers, have y'all passed out the offering? Thank you. You have? You, go ahead, man. If you need an offering on the envelope, go ahead and um, raise your hands and the ushers will get you. I'm confusing y'all. All right, so if, if you need an offering envelope, raise your hands and the ushers will get it to you. All right. Before we take it up, don't, don't take it up yet. Let's, let's get everybody a, an offering envelope. Again, thank y'all for taking your time out to come. It's, it's summertime. Like he was singing this morning, I don't know the song. It's summertime. Summer, summertime. S-U-M-M-E-R. Summer, summer. <laughs> My daddy used to come home when he was on a shift at the police, as a police, and he'd come home and get extra guns. I said, Daddy, what you doing? You see, it's 100 degrees out there. You know black folks go nuts at us. <laughs> I said, no, Dad, you know they just did a study of that and they actually said that when the temperature rises, it seemed like crime rises at the same time. I said, Dad was right the whole time. Man. So that's why I got my piece on here with me. Just. <laughs> <laughs> Ain't know what y'all were going to do to you, you know. This, this been a year to slap. Like, you don't want to, you run out here and try to slap. I ain't gonna be sitting up there talking about, uh-oh. <laughs> I'm gonna pray and say, Lord, let thy mighty hand come between his hand and my face in the name of Jesus. And I'm like, Lord, Lord, and it didn't work. All right, Lord, you gonna do something? <laughs> Amen. Let's go ahead and receive the offering right now. Y'all know I'm just playing, right? Some of y'all are like, mm, mm, mm. What kind of priest are you? I ain't no priest. I'm still working on that tattoo. 
give me a big old sleeve right here, right here, ankle, neck, and have it come out my collar like that. And come out here and just watch y'all judge me. Yep. Y'all don't know what to think, do you? Some of y'all say, is, is he serious? Is he, is, is he playing? Or should we be laughing or, or you know? <laughs> you know? <laughs> You, you got to learn how to live. You got to learn how to have some fun, man. Y some of y'all just too stuck up. It's just something the matter with you. You need to go have a drink or something, you know? <laughs> Look at you. Well, now that you mention it, I carry my communion with me everywhere I go. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. I got folks leave. They're walking out real quick. Now, this, you're lost in mind, you know. <laughs> Amen. Praise God. Well, at this time, if you desire to, <laughs> if you desire to join this church today, <laughs> if God has put it on your heart to join, World Changes Church International, would you please get your person, person belongings and come on down front. We'll receive you right now. If you prayed the prayer of salvation and you want us to continue to, uh, we got some instruction to give to you, you can come on down right now. It's totally up to you. You can come at this time as I speak to our e-church. Uh, <clears throat> if you want to be a part of our e-church membership, go to worldchanges.org and click join at the top of the page. Uh, you can text join WCCI, all one word, to 51555, and we will send you all the benefits of e-membership. Welcome to e-church at World Changers. We, got, we thank God for you, and we believe that the best is yet to come in your life. Amen. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Amen. Praise God. Anybody else? God bless y'all. Father, we thank you for those who've come down, and we ask your blessings to be on them continuously. Prove yourself to them is my prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. If you'll follow this gentleman to the prayer room, they're going to take you and minister to you and give you some information that's going to really help you out. All right, let's stand up for our final blessings and dismiss you guys. Have an amazing day today. Have an awesome week. Learn how to live and enjoy your life. Amen. Amen. Learn how to live and enjoy your life. I went too quick. Look at all these people coming out here now. Look at the law. <laughs> and now unto him who is able to keep you from falling. He who will perfect everything that concerns you. He who will provide protection for you throughout all this week. He will give you long life. I declare your protection of your life, of your family. He that will cause you to prosper and to increase in every way. May the God of all peace and the God of all comfort, may the God of the blessings that overtake you and run you over, May the God of favor and grace be upon you all this week. May wisdom invade all areas of your thinking. And may you see, hear, and understand the wisdom of God that will promote you to the next level. And again, now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the almighty God. Be glory, honor, majesty forever and ever. In Jesus' name, you are blessed. God bless you, everybody. You asked and we answered. We know there are friends of the ministry who prefer CDs and DVDs. But for those of you who find the digital versions of messages better fit your life, Creflo and Taffy Dollar's message series are now available as digital downloads in the CYWE store. Log on to CYWEstore.com today to see the whole catalog of new and re-release messages that can be downloaded to any device for easy and convenient listening.